to her toes On the catwalk, bouncing in a glamorous stroll She's got cameras following wherever she goes She's a supermodel, supermodel She's a ten point hottie from her head to her toes On the catwalk, bouncing in a glamorous stroll She's got cameras following wherever she goes Shots down, it's just the beginning Starting to feel like tabletop dancing It started in 2003 as an idea to affect change and quickly grew to an annual affair with worldwide attention and participation. Microsoft's Imagine Cup invites students to dream big and gives them a platform to take an idea from concept to completion while building sought-after skills they'll be able to use throughout their careers. From Sydney to Sao Paulo and everywhere in between, the Imagine Cup shines a spotlight on groundbreaking new inventions and concepts, all using technology to create new business models, products, and solutions. And now, 
it's come to take its place on a larger scale at the preeminent event for developers, where inspiration meets information and collaboration. The perfect beginning to Microsoft Build. This is the Imagine Cup. Hello and welcome to the 2019 Imagine Cup World Championship. Uh, yes! Woo! Take it. I am Kate Yeager. He is Corporate Vice President of Microsoft Solutions, Corey Sanders, and we are incredibly excited to be your host live from Seattle, Washington, kicking off this year's Microsoft Build Conference. Thousands of developers from around the globe are here to talk about the latest tech and innovation, and we've got three team students who are ready to do the same. Now, these brilliant students have been on quite the journey leading up to the 17th Imagine Cup, where the competition finds a very fitting new home here at Microsoft Build. At Microsoft, our mission is to empower every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more. And our community of developers are instrumental in helping us do just that. They take our latest tools and tech and find new ways to use them for the benefit of all of us. And I'm so excited that this year we have hundreds of student developers along for the ride at Microsoft Build. In addition to Imagine Cup, local students from Seattle schools are joining us. Plus, new this year, Build attendees were invited to bring their children along with them to explore and learn. In fact, we're standing right now in the student zone, which will be the hub for student learning and fun all week, where they can get hands-on with Minecraft, Make Code, Azure, Visual Studio, GitHub, and so much more. We really wanted this build to be about lifelong learning, and I look forward to what this, bring, this week brings for all developers, both budding and established. And I also can't wait to see what happens right now as our Imagine Cup finalists present their concepts. Build is all about making what's great, and it's the perfect home for the 17th annual Imagine Cup and our next generation of creators. Oh! Woo! All right. And let's not forget the spirit of healthy competition, which is what these students have engaged in for the last several months. The Imagine Cup journey began with 30,000 student competitors from 190 countries. From there, teams competed in three regional competitions, with the winner of each region taking home a cool $15,000, and of course, punching their ticket to today's championship. Quite the global journey, to be sure. Almost 30,000 collective miles traveled by our finalists on the way to the championship in Seattle, which is appropriately dubbed Cloud City. Ah, too true, Core Town. Mm -hmm. And this time, Cloud City, well, it isn't just about rain. Further ado, let's meet our regional champs and take a look at their experience on the road to the championship. We are Team Finder. I'm Easy Glucose. We are Team Kylie. It's been absolutely incredible. It's amazing to have the chance to come to Seattle and meet all these teams. Meeting people who are equally passionate about making impact has been a phenomenal experience. The feeling that I can help somebody to lead a better life is the motivation for me. The most exciting moment was the announcement. First place, we were like, oh my god. <laughs> Winning would be so great because it would validate Easy Glucose. We hope to bring Finder to as many blind people as possible. We had an idea. We're going to make sure that it reaches to the people who needs it. We imagine comes the grand stage for us to accomplish this. Dream it. Build it. Live, Live it. it. Ladies and gentlemen, here they are. Your Imagine Cup World Championship finalists. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah. Congratulations on making it this far. Now we'd like you to head backstage and get ready for your presentations. We'll see you in just a couple moments. Now it's time to meet the people who will decide this year's winner. In order to take home that famous trophy and a huge grand prize, our finalists must impress these highly qualified tech veterans. Let's meet our panel of esteemed judges. With an empty savings account, and no idea where she'd be sleeping each night, Arlen Hamilton refused to give up her dream of closing the startup funding gap for people of color, women, and or LGBTQ+. Today, her backstage capital fund has invested over $5 million in 100 companies led by underrepresented founders. Throughout a lengthy career in coding, 
Amjad Masad has been driven by a dedication to make programming more accessible. From his college days, through stops at Yahoo, Facebook, and Code Academy, he continues working to lower entry barriers for developers as the founder and CEO of Replit. And she finds herself in the top 30 of Forbes' 100 most powerful women in the world. This week, she celebrates her sixth year as the chief financial officer for Microsoft. Amy Hood is responsible for Microsoft's worldwide finance organization, including acquisitions and investor relations. Please welcome our AAA panel, Amy Hood, Amjad Massad, and Arlen Hamilton. Okie dokie here, folks. Now it is time to get started. Here is how it all goes down. Each team will have three minutes to pitch their ideas. Our judges will be scoring each presentation based on the solution's technology, innovation, feasibility, and concept. Our grand prize winner takes home $100,000, $50,000 in Azure credits, a mentorship with Microsoft Venture Fund 12, and a priceless mentoring session with the CEO of Microsoft, Satya Nadella. Now, uh, time to get into these presentations. We had the chance to meet with each of these teams in preparation for today's big event. And here's a little preview of each team's project. First up, from India, here's a look at what Team Kylie has in store. We are Team Kylie from India. Kylie is a smart entry pollution mask integrated with the automated drug nebulizer specifically designed for respiratory and asthmatic patients. The thing I love about Team Kylie is they've taken a problem of their community and they found a way to solve it. And the technology that they used, Azure Machine Learning and Cognitive Services, to be able to not only solve it for the individual, but they're taking the data and they're crowdsourcing it. This is such an amazing opportunity to, again, not only help those individuals, but help that entire community. Team Kylie, you have three minutes to wow our judges. That time begins now. Just over a year ago, wildfires in Seattle caused air pollution to rise temporarily to dangerous levels. But there are millions of people who are living in these environment conditions every day of their lives, where they can't just even breathe clean air. Back in India, we have witnessed days when people were confined to their houses just because the air quality was too harmful. And I have seen my friend coughing blood due to prolonged exposure to air pollution. Now, according to World Health Organization, air pollution is the world's largest killer, with number of deaths more than that of AIDS, tuberculosis, and diabetes combined. And this inspired us to come up with a solution to help all of these people. Therefore, we introduce you to Kylie. Kylie is a solution to improve quality of life for people living in poor, poor air quality areas. Kylie is the most advanced anti pollution mask ever built. With six layer filters and a centrifugal fan, it maintains flow of pure air regardless of air pollution outside, and filtering even the most smallest and the dangerous 2.5 pm size particles. To ensure utmost comfort for all day use, we have also integrated Azure Cognitive Services to scan users' face structure and determine the best mask fitment for them so that there are no any kind of design inefficiencies. For respiratory patients, we have worked together with several hospitals to bring you the world's smallest drug nebulizer, small enough to fit right into your palm. It can be easily connected to the Kylie mask, and so the patients can take medicines on the go whenever and anywhere they need it. Patients will also be able to schedule their medicine timings directly from the Kylie app so that they can get automatic drug delivery or haptic reminders. Kylie, using an air quality sensor, will monitor air quality 24 by 7 and sends the data to the cloud for being accessed by everyone. Users can then check air quality around their neighborhood or workplace. And Kylie, using machine learning, will also provide a comprehensive pollution forecast for the next four days. Kylie users will be able to invoke their favorite virtual assistant in a single tap directly from the mask to make or attend calls and carry on with simple day-to-day -day tasks. In order to increase the popularity of an anti-pollution mask among masses, we have also introduced the idea of customizable grills, so children's adults can go for their favorite cartoon character. Users can get their hands on Kylie from direct online sales or from our partnered hospitals or pharmacies. 
and the Kylie's wash air quality data will be available, available to third-party organizations in the form of paid services. Users will be able to buy Kylie for as low as $19, while the nebulizer combo will be available at only $27. The Kylie customization pack can be opted for an extra $7 charge. Thank you, everyone. We are Team Kylie, and we want you to breathe freely. All right. Fantastic job. What a great way to start. Judges, now we'd like to hear a few thoughts from you. So let's start. Arlen, go ahead. Hi. Yes, really, really good. Um, I love what you're doing. I just want to make sure you focus on one thing or, or a couple of things and do them really well. Um, and I, I think also the education that you'll have to um, make sure people understand exactly what the problem is first and then they'll understand um, what your solution is. Because the virtual assistant thing, it's really cool, but I don't know if I need that. Um, if, I don't know why that was added, but please focus on the, the thing that you feel you're going to bring to market first. Right. Great. And then Amjad, what do you have to say? Uh, I would agree with that. I think uh, it's, uh, it's an awesome product. It's a very important, increasingly important issue. And so uh, I think you have a very uh, good core message that you need to focus on. And uh, I think the next challenge for you is to, uh, because a lot of people would need this product, you need to make it affordable and make sure to get, to get as many customers as possible so that people can benefit from it. But, uh, but a great job, and I look forward to see what, where you take this. Thank you, I'm John, and thank you, Team Kylie. Fantastic job. Really well done. Now over to you, Kate. Thank you very much, Corey, and a strong start to our championship. Let, let's keep things moving. Our second presentation of the day comes from Team Finder, winner, winner of the EMEA Regional. Here's a sneak peek at their solution. Introducing Finder, a quick and easy solution to find any object in your room. We're not using any tracking device, we just use a stereo camera. What's really exciting about Finder is they've taken a problem and really driven home how much more challenging it is for the visually impaired. They've solved it. They've come up with a solution that takes augmented reality to be able to determine where things are in space, artificial intelligence to be able to detect objects, and of course, bringing that together with cognitive services. It really is an amazing set of capabilities coming together for a real world problem. Now it's our turn to see this solution in person. Team Finder, you have three minutes on the clock. That time begins now. Hey, I'm Ferdinand from Team Finder. And I'm Sachit. Have you ever lost something like a key, wallet, or phone? I'm sure I have. Well, over the past couple of months, we've been working together with the UK's leading charity to find out more about this problem. John, one of our test users, has shared the following story with us. Once, he was looking for a book for three days straight and wasn't able to find it. How it turned out, the book was beside him the entire time. As I got a dyslexia myself, I regularly use speech-to-text software and other softwares to help me with my disability. Finder aims to do the same for people with visual abilities to empower them to become more independent to find lost objects. How our technology can help John. We utilize a custom-built 3D stereo camera to pinpoint every object in 3D space. Then we use Azure technologies such as spatial anchors, Cosmos DB, and custom vision to power spatial intelligence. Then we use our custom-built iOS application to navigate the user towards the object using an AI experience. We use haptic feedback and stereo audio to navigate the user towards the object. You can hear a, play, a fire noise in the background. When I get closer, it will get louder. I can use haptic engine to feed me towards the right position. Once I reach Your the target, is directly ahead. There, I get a notification that the object is directly ahead. That way, I know I've reached my target and I can grab it easily. Our go to market is a partnership with the RNIB to install 1,000 cameras into people's homes within the next six months. We then want to install, the cameras will be sold at a 199 each with a monthly subscription fee which can be offset by a grant from the British government to cover the cost of the system. 
Next, I want to introduce John, and let's see what he has to say about the app. So if you would have to describe the product in four words, what would you say? Um, I can describe it in two of you. Absolutely fantastic. <laughs> so that was John. Um, so Finder really aims to do the same what speech to text software has done for me. Make me independent, make me have an independent life. That way, visually impaired people do not have to rely on caretakers, people's family, to make them find, help them find their objects. We have Finder, say it, fi hear it, find it. Woo! Awesome job, Finder, fantastic. All right, let's hear again from our judges. This time we'll start with Amjad, go ahead. Um, I mean, I, I sure could use it. You know, the, the remote control that I lose every time <laughs> would be great to find it. But um, yeah, I, th I think it's an important problem, and the you know uh, the technology is pretty awesome. How you're using, how you're utilizing Azure to do uh, spatial and vision, that's really cool. Um, and I think it's an important problem. So uh, yeah, I, I'm uh, excited to see where you take it. Thank you so much, Amy. What are your thoughts? I think what's interesting is when I think about accessibility, and when you are able to build great solutions for users. Yeah. It actually has very broad application yeah. as opposed to narrow. And I think this really brings that home for me, and I think probably everybody's seeing this. So I really love the focus, but actually it's more expansive yeah. than maybe I initially thought. I have a grandma thought. with uh, Alzheimer's, uh, and she loses things all the time. She hides them, she never finds them. And I'm definitely planning when I get back to Germany to install one of those cameras in her home to help her. Great. Great. Well, thank you so much, Finder. Thank, so thank you so much. Kate, two amazing products down, one left to go. Well, Corey, we are down to our final pitch of the events, and the excitement here at Microsoft Build is, well, building. I did need that, thank you. Here's a quick look at what Team Easy Glucose from California has created. Easy Glucose makes blood glucose monitoring for diabetic patients painless, fast, and cheap by analyzing images of the eye. I love how Brian really brought it home and personal. He talked about the issues that his grandma has uh, and the pain and challenges of taking those pinpricks. To be able to take the technologies of virtual machines and SQL databases and to create a great experience that's very non-invasive, it truly is unbelievable. What's really impressed me about Brian is the fact that he's only 18 years old and he already has a patent pending for this technology. I can only imagine what it would be like to have a patent pending at this age. Time for our final team of the day. You've got three minutes on the clock. Start that clock now. Hi, I'm Brian, a freshman at UCLA. Diabetes is the fastest growing chronic disease, affecting over 400 million people worldwide. Because there's no cure for it, patients have to constantly monitor and measure their blood sugar levels up to 10 times per day. The problem is that it's done through these invasive finger stick tests, which are not only painful and inefficient, but because a new test strip is required every single time, it's actually extremely expensive, costing patients thousands and the entire American health system $250 billion per year. I was personally drawn to this problem when I found out that my own grandmother was diagnosed with diabetes, and hearing about her difficulties inspired me to come up with Easy Glucose, which provides, for the first time ever, painless, cheap, and fast glucose monitoring on the go. How is this possible? Our blood glucose levels are actually highly correlated to our glucose levels in the eye, and by analyzing images of the eye, we can determine our glucose levels by looking at specific structures inside the iris. Patients first snap on this cheap lens adapter onto their smartphone cameras, and by holding it up to their face, they're able to capture high-quality images of their own eye. From here, Easy Glucose analyzes the image and returns the glucose reading in under a second at virtually no cost and without any of the pain, blood, or risk of infection of traditional methods. This is all through, done through an Azure deep learning framework that was built 
on top of virtual machines and SQL databases. And since everything is happening directly on the phone, there's no need for internet connection. With an error rate of 7% against traditional methods, not only is easy glucose clinically accurate, but it also outperforms current non-invasive methods by over 30%. Our market strategy is to first focus on the half million diabetics inside the California Bay Area. To bring this to market, there's a patent pending for the deep learning framework, and the next step is to gather more data and clinically validate easy glucose through trials in collaboration with Stanford Medicine, and then obtain FDA approval. There's a one-time $10 cost for the lens adapter and a monthly subscription of $20 for unlimited tracking to bring in recurring revenue, but also saving patients thousands per year. Easy Glucose captures a new opportunity that has only been made available by recent advances in machine learning, faster smartphones, and better smartphone cameras. It's transforming the way glucose monitoring is done. And I'm looking forward to the day where millions of diabetics, like my own grandmother, don't need to worry about these invasive finger stick tests to live freely with diabetes. Thank you. All right. Woo. Well done, Easy Glucose. Well done. All right. This time we're going to start with Arlen. Let's hear what you had to think. Wow. So really love what you're doing here. It, it will be interesting to see what this is going to replace um, in, in the process and see how, how it uh, affects someone in the daily life having diabetes. Um, I just have to say, in general, I'm very excited that the youth I'm very um, excited that you're going to be working on this while I get old. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's awesome. And we'll close out here with Amy. I tell you what, I'm always inspired when people see an existing problem and solution and say, I have a completely different way of solving it that fundamentally helps make both this nation and globally to address something that can't continue to exist, which is the high cost of healthcare. It's super inspiring. I love that it's focused, and it really solves a very specific need. Great job. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Fantastic. Yeah, good luck to you. Absolutely. All right. Back over to you, Kate. Whew, all right, well, great way to end those presentations for sure. Now our judges are faced with the seemingly impossible task of deciding this year's winner. Now, while they decide the fate of our finalists, I understand we've got some special guests in the audience there, Corey. We do, we absolutely do. As luck would have it, we have last year's Imagine Cup championship team here in the audience today. Let's hear it for them, smart arm. <laughs> Last year, Team Smart Arm from Canada impressed our judges with their low-cost, smart prosthetic arm, which I think he has here, that they developed, and due to their amazing innovation, they took home the Imagine Cup trophy. In fact, with the demo not even working, if memory serves. It works now. It works, it works now. Okay, good. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. My bad. All right. Please welcome Hamail and Samim here. Yes. Hey, thank you. So, gentlemen, thank you so much for joining. Hamail. Give us an update on Smartum. I heard you met with the Prime Minister of Canada. Is that yeah. true? I mean, we are at Build, so he's no Satya, but he's a pretty cool That's guy. A good line. <laughs> um, so we went up to him, and I was already practicing uh, doing my pitch to him. And then I get there, and he starts telling me about it, right? I'm like, come on, man, you're stealing my thunder. But he's a great guy. <laughs> ah, so he stole your thunder. All right, so you mentioned Satya. So, I mean, you, yeah. you had a mentoring session with Satya. How'd that go? Did he give you some good input? Yeah, it was very transformative. And I think we'll see with his keynote how much he really embodies the mission statement of wanting to empower every person and organization to do more. And I, I think it was really insightful because he gave us an idea that it is now kind of on the onus of us in our generation and one of the judges was touching on that, that it's really on us to make sure we have that meaningful impact and create a sustainable, fu uh, sustainable future for the rest of the population. That's so. awesome. That's awesome. So I see you have the arm with you. This is the latest. This is the latest. What are some of the changes? Because I remember it obviously a year ago. What are some of the changes that you've been able to make? Yeah. So we actually added a screen on the back. That's, oh, that's one of awesome. the biggest things. So whatever object you're picking up, it'll actually show you the object on the screen. Oh, that's live. cool. Right. So you can confirm, you know, it's the, it's the right thing you're interacting with. 
Um, and we got some grippy inserts for the palm. Oh, it's cool. uh, just a better functional product. So it just grabs things better. Yeah. That's awesome. That's so what's next? I know you've got, like, what are the next ideas that you want to add to it? So I think the biggest thing is that, and we also kind of got these insights from Satya, is that you want to be making sure that you're building this closely alongside the actual users that it's designed for. Otherwise, how are you going to ensure that it's having the impact that we're promising? And so that was part of the reason why we kind of uh, use this material, because we realized that the objects were slipping out of the hands of the amputees. And so next steps is, again, just kind of continuing to iterate. It's yeah. all about the process all of about working learn and grow. Exactly. Yeah. So you have a whole bunch of students here, very exciting environment. If there's one thing that you could tell these students, what would it be? You know, this is definitely the case with what I learned with SmartArm. Um, oftentimes, ideas don't come out fully formed. They only become more clear as you work on them. Mm -hmm. And so if you have an idea, if you have a project or any sort of passion in mind, just start somewhere and you'll figure it out along the way. And I think I really want to emphasize that it's all about the process. Whatever happens with the competition today, I hope you guys continue working on this. If this idea fails, focus on the next one. Just keep going. And you guys are all very talented, so I'm sure you'll come up with something cool. Fantastic. Well, thank you guys so much. Let's thank hear it for you. Team Smart Arm coming back here. Thank you so much for joining us. And congratulations on the big win from last year. Really well done. to move forward as well and find out who will be the next Imagine Cup world champion. Our A-list judges, get it, have finished compiling scores for our three finalists. Amy, Amjad, and Arlen, a huge thank you again for being here today and for helping us out with the Imagine Cup. You guys had an inc incredibly important task and you nailed it. There it is. There it is, all right, are we ready? Yeah! Okay, so now, we have, this is the envelope that, is that we're the envelope. going to be using here. So great, all three finalists did a great job showing off their ideas. And now it's time to find out who will take home the title. Guys, a huge welcome back to you on stage. You did great. You got to be breathing a sigh of relief. All of your demos are done. Guys, let's how about a, give them a round of applause. Round of applause. <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah. I hold here. I hold here in my hands the results of the 2019 Imagine Cup World Championship. And so we're gonna get going here. In third place, Team Finder from the United Kingdom. Congratulations. Congratulations and, and congratulations for making it this far. And thank you so much for being a part of this year's Imagine Cup. We're excited to see how your project progresses from here, so keep working on it. Absolutely, now third place also gets $30,000 in Azure grants, not too shabby. Corey, then there were two. Indeed there were. And no matter who is named champion, both teams are already winners. The runner-up in this year's Imagine Cup will take home $40,000 in Azure grants and Surface laptops, by the way, while first place wins $150,000 in cash in Azure grants, mentoring with M12, and of course that priceless mentoring session with Satya Nadella. Before we crown the champion, I want to make one last announcement. Microsoft is dedicated to empowering students to learn and grow, and hopefully considering careers in STEM through access to technology and resources. We thought one way to help in this endeavor, to continue to empower the next generation of technologists, is to provide a state-of-the-art device on which students can develop. So I'm thrilled to announce all of the students attending Build this year are going home with a brand new Surface Go. Exciting stuff, guys. Exciting stuff. So, let's keep it going and crown the champion, shall we? Okay. All right. Grab the uh, I'm cup grabbing there. the trophy, Corey. Let's go. And the winner of the 2019 Imagine Cup World Championship is Team Easy Glucose from the United States. <laughs> Second place, Team Kylie from India. Congratulations as well. Fantastic, and congratulations for winning the title. Yeah. And that does it for us, but stay tuned to the Vision Keynote coming up live in mere moments. Right now, enjoy this look at the highlights from today's Imagine Cup World Championship. And remember, dream it. Build it. Live it. Yeah. It's heavy.
All right, we are here with the winner. Let's give him a hand again, Brian from Easy Glucose. How you doing, buddy? I'm doing great. <laughs> so, uh, how did you come up with this idea? I know you had this story with your grandmother, but then there must have been some other realization. Right, so I started looking into how exactly glucose monitoring is done today, and reading a lot of these papers inspired me to see how exactly I could apply machine learning to this field, and that's how I came up with the idea behind Easy Glucose. Now here's the thing, everybody saw like the end product. Can you tell us a little bit about the work that went into it? Because I'm, I'm sure there was a lot of work and we saw only the end product. Tell us about the blood, sweat, and tears. Yeah, so it was a lot of reading papers, reading about current methods, how exactly I can improve it. And in order to build the deep learning framework, I had to reach out to real diabetic patients, gather the data, and also work with actual professors to, you know, even further my findings. So tell us a little bit about, like, there's got to be a time where you're like, because look, I do machine learning too, and sometimes it just doesn't work. Tell us about the hard time where you're like, I need to push through. There had to be a moment where you had to decide to do it. Yeah. The first initial version of the deep learning framework didn't work that well, so eventually I expanded it to a multi-stage, a two-part actually process, and that ended up increasing the accuracy. But going from the first prototype version to the second one was definitely a lot of work and hope in my product. So was it like late night coding type stuff? Or tell, tell us about that, because we say a lot of work, and I'm like wondering, I mean, because one day I'm going to be obviously be the janitor in this huge building, and so tell us about the work. Yeah, it's definitely a lot of late night codings, kind of just racking your brain for ideas, you know, preparing your business plan and everything. Yep. So tell me about the process of Imagine Cups, because I feel like everyone that's watching just saw like the end product. There's probably like this really long phase. Tell us about that. Yeah, so it was about like six to nine months to actually develop the entire thing. And then I had to record a video, write a 10 page proposal to submit it for the initial part. And then when I came to the regional finals here in Seattle, I again had to do a three minute pitch, five minute demo, Q&A with all the judges, and then finally here today. So this dude is like 18 years old and has patent pendings. So hopefully one day, you know, when I need work, you'll, you'll let me come be your janitor or something, right? Yeah, for sure. So no, what are you going to do with the $100,000 to advance your product? Buy a car. No, just kidding. I'm going to reinvest it into Easy Glucose, and we're going to do additional data collection and really clinical trials to make sure it's as accurate as possible. So I, I'm guessing that because it's a medical type thing, there's a lot of other hurdles that you need to jump through. Tell us about that. Right, so it's definitely just about you know, publishing the research, making, being very transparent with the results, and then obtaining FDA approval so that we can actually get it to market, mar market and then working with insurance companies to make it ac as accessible as possible. This guy, am I right? So how did you get involved in tech in general? What led you to this field? Yeah, so I grew up in California, the Bay Area. A lot of people are doing kind of computer science fairs. In high school, I did a lot of kind of scientific research and science fairs, and that kind of led me to my interest in applying computer science to solve a lot of these healthcare problems. So that's amazing. Now, you are working by yourself the whole time, is that right? Yeah, I did the deep learning development by myself, but I definitely had the support of, you know, my parents, my friends, and also the professors that I'm working with. So tell us a little about the Azure. What are you doing with Azure to make this actually work? Yeah, exactly. Azure is incredibly critical to the success of this technology. And so in order to develop the deep learning framework, I had to get an Azure virtual machine with all these GPUs and the computational power to actually train it in the first place. And in order to ensure that it works offline, it needs to be synced periodically to the database in the back end. And I built that all with Azure SQL databases. Then the app is done with Azure mobile apps. And there's also automated alerts so that parents get notified if their children have dangerously low or high glucose levels and that's all done through a web backend with Azure web apps. I don't know what I was doing when I was 18 but it wasn't <laughs> I, feel, I feel like it wasn't that so that's awesome so tell us a little bit about future looking how are you gonna invest this money are you gonna get more people what's gonna go on I mean I mean you could hire me I mean I mean <laughs> Yeah, it's all about the first initial step is gathering more data, and we're going to be looking to find a lot of diabetic patients at the Stanford Medicine Hospital and really gather their eye data. And from, them, from there, develop more powerful models that generalize not only, I mean, generalize to specific demographics like your race or your age and so on and so forth. So how does it, like, look at your eye and just know from the, like, if you're looking at my eye, do people, do you see sugar in here? I mean, I don't understand how... 
Right, so essentially easy glucose finds the most relevant structures inside your iris. They're like crisps, uh, furrows, and then ridges. And what the deep learning framework does is it analyzes a bunch of these eye image data and it learns the most relevant features inside these eye images that are most predictive of your blood glucose level. So when you compare it to like the other methods, you said there was a huge improvement. Right. Like what are the other people doing that you thought, boy, this should be a lot better? Yes, yeah, so a lot of the other people are using these kind of bulky methods, attaching sensors to your ears or your wrists, and even those that have been doing it on the eye have required these large lab equipment that aren't portable at all. And so Easy Glucose is able to leverage kind of the technology that's now available today, you know, your faster smartphones, and this enables Easy Glucose to do everything, you know, in a very portable fashion that's very usable for diabetics patients every single day. Well, this has been amazing. Let's give him a really big hand. I, I love being able to talk to you about that. So I'm pretty excited to be here. Thanks so much for, for showing us this awesome technology. And one day, when he has this huge building, you might see me in there cleaning the toilets because I'm really good at that, actually. Well, hopefully everyone's excited to be here at Build as well. Uh, there are t there's tanning room only over here. You can go to Hall 6 e and F, or you can go upstairs to look at the actual stream that's going on right now. But I'm excited to say that Build will start momentarily.
please welcome John Knoll and Andrew Chaikin. Good morning. Welcome to Microsoft Build. My name is, my name is John Knoll and I'm Chief of Creative Officer at Industrial Light and Magic. Uh, the Apollo 11 moon landing was cutting edge technology of the 1960s. And today, with the help of my friend, fellow Apollo aficionado, and author of A Man on the Moon, Andy Chaikin. Hi, everybody. We're going to recreate the mission using some 21st century technology, using the power of Unreal Engine and HoloLens 2. Andrew? Thank you, John. Well, the Apollo 11 moon landing happened 50 years ago on July 20th, 1969. And like you, I've been waiting for that for a long time. And what made it possible was this. <laughs> well, it's, uh, it seems that doing a live demo is actually harder than uh, landing on the moon. Indeed. Thank you for your time. <laughs> and welcome to Build 2019. It's fantastic to see you all in Seattle. You know, Build has always um, had a very special meaning for me. Um, I remember very distinctly being in the audience in 1991 uh, at our very first developer conference, and um, that's when I decided to join Microsoft. And ever since, I've marked the passage of time and life in tech paradigms, and so it's great uh, to be back here at Build and talking about technology. Uh, I want to first start by welcoming all the young developers in attendance. In fact, for the first time, we have children of Build attendees uh, here. We have our student ambassadors, of course, the Imagine Cup uh, participants, as well as students from local schools in Seattle. So a special welcome to all of you. You know, Build is all about imagining what's possible, uh, but more importantly, making it possible. And over the next couple of days, you're going to be looking and seeing a lot of technology. But the real thing is, how do we galvanize and come together as engineers, as developers, to make that world possible? And when I think about the world today, as computing is getting embedded in the world, where every place, whether it's our homes, our offices, factories, stadiums, every industry from oil and gas to retail to agriculture to financial services, everything from connected cars to connected refrigerators to smart surgical tools to smart coffee machines, are all being driven by software. That's the opportunity in front of us, the opportunity for developers and our colleagues from all other disciplines to come together to build this new world. And that's the sense of purpose mission that grounds us at Microsoft. 
to empower every person in every organization on the planet to achieve more. It starts by empowering all of you as developers to go after that moonshot in any industry, in any sphere of life or society. Now, we'll talk a lot about this opportunity throughout this keynote and throughout this conference. But we also share a deep responsibility together. It starts with us as platform providers, but we have a collective responsibility. A few years ago when we started talking about it, it felt a bit prosaic to talk about responsibility in tech conferences where it's all about the glitz of technology. Uh, but it's no longer the case. Uh, to us, really thinking about the trust at the, in everything that we build, in the technology we build, is so core. And as engineers, we need to truly incorporate this in the core design process, in the tooling around how we build things. So when we think about privacy and the fact that privacy is a human right, is as much of an engineering design principle as an engineering process issue. Same thing with cybersecurity, same thing with AI ethics. How do you build systems without bias? These are core engineering challenges where we have to push the state of the art around the tooling, the process, and the responsibility we take to what we build. In fact, talking about cybersecurity, one of the most important things we have to ensure is our critical infrastructure remains secure. Uh, I'm really thrilled to announce an open source project which we have collaborated with a, a partner called Fair uh, and uh, Free and Fair, uh, and this is Election Guard. Uh, one of the things that we want to ensure is real transparency and verifiability in election systems. And so this is an open source project that will be live on GitHub by end of this month, uh, which will even bring some new technology from Microsoft Research around homomorphic encryption so that you can have the software stack that can modernize all of the election infrastructure everywhere in the world. And it's fantastic to see this type of innovation really across all of the core areas of trust. Now, I want to talk about four distinct platform opportunities. Throughout this conference, we will really go into the details around these four opportunities. Now, the first one, is the intelligent cloud and the intelligent edge platform that Azure enables. Uh, that's the thing that we'll spend a lot of time on uh, today as well as the rest of the conference. It provides the core hybrid infrastructure, but it also provides the data and AI runtimes for the world's applications. We'll talk about business process automation as a first class platform uh, for the first time at our developer conference. So important. Uh, so we'll talk about Dynamics 365 and Power Platform. We'll talk about Microsoft 365 and how this is the productivity and communications fabric that creates the scaffolding for all developers. We'll talk about gaming. So these are the four platforms that I want to sort of really get into in some detail. So let's start with Azure. We're building out Azure as the world's computer. We have 54 data center regions around the world. In fact, we are so thrilled to have the first public, be the first public cloud with data center regions in the continent of Africa. Uh, we've started operating out of South Africa. It's really, I can't wait to see all of the development uh, that happens around that uh, data center capa capability. Uh, we also have more certifications than any other public cloud out there. Uh, we have over 90 compliance certifications. And why is that important? It's because it, we have to meet the real world needs, regulated industries, data sovereignty needs, operational sovereignty needs. You need to be able to meet the world's complexity with what you build so that it really enables all of you as developers to be able to build with less friction. We're also building out Azure as an open platform. Windows and Linux is first class. .NET and Java are first class. SQL and Postgres are first class. We have Kubernetes workloads. We have Red Hat, OpenShift workloads. We have uh, workloads from VMware. We really want to make sure that every layer of the stack, again, meets the needs of developers. We are not stopping there. We're extending the cloud to the edge. 
This is what we've always had as a vision for distributed computing, which is there's a cloud and an edge, and distributed computing will remain distributed. So Azure to Azure Stack to Azure Data Box Edge to Azure Connect, HoloLens 2, Azure IoT, Azure Sphere. In fact, in this conference, I'm really thrilled about the Azure Database Edge. Uh, it brings the database engine to ARM processors in the edge, has time series support, streaming support. You can bring AI compute to the edge. It's so great to see this distributed computing fabric come alive to help developers build the applications of the future. Now, the thing, when you talk about hybrid, what is important is to think about the consistency, the consistency between the cloud and the edge when it comes to the operating models. That is, the management and security. The development environment, how does the DevOps pipeline work across the two? And as importantly, the technology stacks. And this is where you can make simplistic assumptions of having some homogeneous infrastructure on the two sides. You have to meet the real world needs. So that's what we've been hard at work in Microsoft. When we talk about hybrid, it's doing the hard work to bring this level of consistency between the cloud and the edge so that developers can move the code that they have today and build a new code on top of this platform. Now, in fact, this, right after my keynote, you're going to hear from Scott. Uh, where you, he's going to talk in much more detail about all of the features, functionality coming uh, to Azure. In fact, there are 25 major updates and new features right at this conference. So really thrilling to see the progress being made. And all this is leading to amazing momentum in Azure. The world's brands are building on Azure. 95% of the Fortune 500 already use Azure. Uh, and it's great to see from retail to healthcare to manufacturing to automotive. So I thought I'll just share some of the ambition. One of the things that really excites me is right now, as we speak, there are more software developers being hired outside of what is considered the tech industry, and it's only going to grow. That's the proliferation of what is the power of software going forward, and you see that ambition. So I want to talk, tell you a little bit about these stories. First is Walgreens Boots Alliance. Now, Walgreens is one of the largest pharmacies out there, and they're doing many things with us, but one of the things that I'm really excited to see is they're also working with startups like Cooler Screens to completely change how the retail experience works. And Cooler Screens is using the latest and greatest AI from Azure to change the retail experience, in this case, starting with these uh, refrigeration uh, units. Uh, AB InBev, largest beer manufacturer, they have this very nice phrase, which is from barley to bars, where they're completely revolutionizing how they think about the supply chain and the yield uh, for barley or, uh, to tracking everything using IoT to also then using cognitive services to track social media. So it's end-to-end -end digital transformation. Now, St. Jude's and DNA Nexus. DNA Nexus is the ISV working with St. Jude's Hospital to you know, really go after this fight against childhood cancer, which is an underserved research area, to be able to then use Azure Genomics to get the genomic data, but most importantly, how do you create a research cloud so that scientists from multiple organizations can all collaborate to go after this disease? JP Morgan Chase has chosen to use the Azure blockchain service to bring the, the Quorum, which is a variant of Ethereum, uh, to market uh, alongside us. So it's fantastic to see the innovation of new software products and projects coming uh, from the financial services incumbents uh, as well. at and is, is rolling out 5G, and they chose Azure Stack for their compute on the, at the edge. And they're working with ISVs uh, such as Warpole, which is a drone safety tracker. So the idea that you need low latency edge compute in order to be able to really make sure that the airspace with drones is safe is such a critical need. So therefore, that's kind of a sample application uh, of what is possible as 5G rolls out, and then you have this ubiquitous cloud and edge. Now, I want to bring us home to another iconic brand that's right out of Seattle. 
In fact, it got started a few uh, miles from here at Pike Place, Starbucks. Uh, Starbucks is, of course, defined what our morning coffee experience is. Um, and, and, and at this point, one of the things that's so exciting to see is the software engineers at Starbucks, their ambition, their collaboration with their colleagues in the business side and product managers and marketing, they're coming together to completely take what is that iconic experience of Starbucks and incorporate digital throughout. Everything from what they're doing with blockchain and sustainability, IoT and the coffee machines, as well as AI. And to really give you a glimpse of this, let me throw to the show floor to our team to show you what the Starbucks engineers are dreaming up and making real. Today we're gonna to show you three things Starbucks are doing to better connect with their customers and enable their personnel. Firstly, create more intelligent customer experiences with an internal AI platform called Deep Brew. Secondly, securely connecting their coffee equipment to Azure with Azure Sphere. And finally, providing transparency into how the cup of coffee you drank this morning made its way from the farm to your local Starbucks. Starbucks have created a sophisticated intelligent recommendation system based on reinforcement learning models that they call Deep Brew. Starbucks can use Deep Brew insights in many areas of their business, including this new, more intelligently responsive drive through which is an early pilot. Here, you can see four recommended choices for a Starbucks in Santa Monica. These aren't four fixed products for every Starbucks. Rather, they're selected by Deep Brew after weighing many factors. What is popular at this specific store, at this time of day, time of year, what's currently available in the store, even current weather conditions, and more. After I ask the drive through attendant for the cloud macchiato, the display shows me additional recommendations that Deep Brew knows are popular with those who have made the same choice as me under similar conditions. Not all Starbucks local markets are the same. Let me show you what you might see on the same day in Alaska. Notice that the choices are different, reflecting the unique local preferences for this store. And the recommendations, if I choose the sous vide egg bites, will be tailored as well. The refresher that's showing up on the display looks actually pretty tempting to me. The Starbucks award-winning mobile app leverages these deep brew insights, as well as my own personal order history, to make even more personal recommendations. Deep Brew is a new platform for Starbucks to innovate and experiment with rapidly scalable and cutting edge machine learning. And it allows Starbucks to better meet the preferences of their diverse and worldwide customer base and empower their personnel. Starbucks digital information transformation doesn't stop there. Olivia is gonna show us how Starbucks is connecting their essential coffee equipment in their 30,000 stores globally. Starbucks uses Azure to administer their connected coffee equipment. They're currently piloting Azure IoT Central, Microsoft's hosted platform for IoT solutions to centralize some of this work. As you can see, this Azure IoT Central dashboard shows data from the local Starbucks stores. Think of this as mission control for your morning coffee. By connecting the equipment to Azure IoT Central, Starbucks can monitor water temperature, pressure, pull time, and more to ensure their flagship Mastrana 2 machines in stores are performing at their best to enable baristas to make the highest quality handcrafted beverages every time. Connecting the Mastrana 2 to Azure IoT Central also allows Starbucks to run predictive maintenance models to more efficiently operate their machines. This device telemetry and predictive maintenance allows Starbucks to remotely diagnose potential problems, reduce maintenance costs, and most importantly, achieve higher customer satisfaction by freeing up time to allow their partners to connect with their customers. While Starbucks could use Azure with any IoT device to connect their equipment, they chose Azure Sphere, Microsoft's end-to-end -end solution for securely connected devices, which comprises of an MCU embedded with Microsoft's secure architecture, a Linux-based custom OS, and cloud security service, specifically because their coffee equipment is so vital to their business. 
Starbucks can embed the Azure Sphere custom microcontroller into new equipment, but vitally, they can also retrofit Azure Sphere into existing machines by plugging this external module into the device. No need to replace valuable existing equipment. Multiple times a year, Starbucks introduces new seasonal coffee. This requires updates on the soft, uh, software updates on the coffee machines. Previously, this would have required tens of thousands of USB sticks to be delivered to stores. Now the recipes can be delivered securely over the air from cloud to the Azure Sphere-enabled device at the click of a button, which you can see in the Azure IoT Central Pilot, accelerating Starbucks' innovation process from months to days and making the pathway for new innovation. Starbucks Digital Transformation is expanding beyond their Seattle offices and coffee shops to its vast supply chain, which starts at over 380,000 farms in nearly 30 countries. Starbucks recently previewed at its annual shareholders meeting a new digital transparency feature for customers. With this feature, I can use my phone to scan a code on this bag of coffee. To, act, to see an immutable record of the coffee's history stored on Azure blockchain service. With this, customers can see, let me just get this up, yep. So with this, you can see that, we can see where the coffee beans were grown. Starbucks support efforts for farmers in those regions, when and where the beans were roasted, tasting notes, and more. Starbucks' ambition is to use this technology to provide greater empowerment for coffee farmers as coffee drinkers better understand where the coffee comes from and who grows it. With Azure Blockchain Service, data can be real-time and transparent. As you've seen, so much of Starbucks business is being transformed by digital technology. And at Microsoft, we're excited to see where we can go next together. Back to you, Satya. Thank you so much, Anita and Olivia. It's fantastic. You know, we, um, we in the tech industry have always uh, been inspired by coffee for our brands, but I must say Deep Brew, uh, I think, is going to really have more of an impact in our lives every morning, and I'm looking forward to it. And now, I want to uh, switch to talking about AI, because one of the key things that Azure has also been very focused on is how do we truly democratize access to AI? The breakthroughs are coming at amazing speed. In fact, just uh, even this year, Microsoft achieved human parity uh, in conversational Q&A. But it's not just these breakthroughs. How do we translate these breakthroughs into services and infrastructure and frameworks and tools uh, for developers? And that's really what we're uh, really focused on. In terms of infrastructure, we have some very exciting announcements around inference capabilities uh, with FPGA that are going to be available uh, to, as GA. Uh, we're also making sure that we don't get locked in to some insidious vertical integration. So Onyx support around inference, whether it's both with Intel and NVIDIA, is so important because we don't want that play of having frameworks to silicon, we get to of some vertical integration that, allow, that just creates lock-in. So we really want to make sure that this infrastructure remains open and open standards. We're also investing to make sure that the tooling is making developers around AI and ML more productive. Uh, one of the things that you'll see in Azure ML advances is the no-code ML uh, tools. It's great to see that. Uh, but it's also the pipeline, uh, the Azure DevOps is being extended for ML ops or machine learning ops. And so it's fantastic to bring that same rigor of development and engineering and deployment uh, to uh, machine learning practices. Now, when it comes to services, uh, we continue to take the breakthroughs that we have across all of the various cognitive services and make them available to developers. Uh, there are advances throughout vision, speech, language, translation, uh, and a new service around decision. This is about reinforcement learning brought to anomaly detection and personalization, and it's really exciting to see this. Uh, we have many, many of these cognitive services, and the pattern of these cognitive services is to have them available in the cloud. You can customize them, especially the last layers. You can even put them in containers, take it to the edge devices and of course use the rich ML uh, tool chain around it. So that capability is what's driving uh, productivity. Now, one service I wanted to uh, showcase today is the Azure Speech Service. 
Uh, not only is the speech service getting better and better uh, when it comes to speech recognition, in fact, what you'll see in this demo is even for commodity hardware to replace any complex microarray setup so that your speech recognition is world class. But the most interesting thing is when you combine speech recognition with language models that are specific to your organizational data, you can start picking up all the jargon. So imagine a transcript that gets created that has the ability to understand the local jargon that's specific to your organization, your industry, that, that way making the transcript that much more useful. So let's throw it uh, to our team uh, out on the gallery to show you speech translation and transcription. Getting you. The prototype device connected to a cloud service that provided live transcription and translation. We are proud to announce today that we're making the conversation transcription capability within Azure Speech Services available as a preview release. Come on, let me show you. You might also remember this hardware from last year, which we're also making available as a developer device kit. But today, my colleagues and I are going to give you a demo of new research that we believe will make meeting transcriptions more easily available to everyone in the future. We are going to show you this demo using just the microphones built into this laptop and these two smartphones we have in front of us. With these, we create a microphone array in the cloud that enables Azure Speech Services to provide accurate in-person meeting transcription, even without a special meeting device. Also, you will notice that I didn't bring my phone. But the service can still recognize my voice and correctly identify me because I've given it permission to use my voice print to transcribe what I say. Now, the second thing we're going to show you is that the language model of Azure Speech Service can be trained on the data in your company's Microsoft 365 tenant so it can learn the unique vocabulary of your industry or company. This is available in private preview. OK, so basically, for the next two minutes, we're going to have a rap battle of sorts, <laughs> but for all of us geeks here in the room. So Heiko is a principal PM on the speech team, and he's going to give us an example of some dev speak. And Yusuf is in healthcare marketing, and he's going to dazzle us with a little bit of healthcare tech jargon. So while they speak, I encourage you to follow along with the transcript on the screen so you can see just how powerful the service is. Heiko, take us away. Azure Speech Services are built with VMs running on Azure hypervisors using Ubuntu-based Docker containers that are orchestrated with the Azure Kubernetes service. Azure Speech Services enable a variety of technical capabilities, including ASR, Neural TTS, Microsoft Translator, and related custom services. You can access these using your favorite programming language, such as Java, JavaScript, Node.js, C++, or C Sharp and others. The bar has been set. OK, now it's your turn to give us a bit of this healthcare jargon. Microsoft Teams can provide EHR integration through ISV vendors, including Infor Cloverleaf, Redox, and others via the HL7 Fire standard. HL7 Fire is HIPAA, Mars E, and GDPR compliant and is based on modern technology, including HTTPS and RESTful protocols, as well as extensible APIs. The Fire open source community makes their source available on GitHub, and the Microsoft Teams Fire implementation is also aligned with Project Argonaut and follows the US core profiles for all the Fire resources it consumes. Well, that was fun. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to call that a draw. So while we're going a bit overboard there, we understand that this is incredibly important so that every company in every industry with their own specific jargon can have accurate transcriptions. We're really excited about where this work will take us, and our future ambition is to enable conversation transcriptions for anyone, anywhere, at any time. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Heiko, Sonia, and Yusuf. It's fantastic to see that language models, which are tenant-specific, come to life with speech recognition that's high quality. And I think that's going to be a really game changer. Now, the other uh, service that is really uh, 
got tremendous momentum is these conversational interfaces that are being built using bot framework. In fact, 3,000 new bots or, or conversational apps are getting created using this framework each week. And you will see in this conference many new features, everything from how to make the multi-turn dialogue much better and more robust, uh, how to take, uh, in fact, Q and, the Q&A Maker uh, toolkit, which takes any PDF document and turns it into a conversational canvas capability. So lots and lots of new features. The language modeling uh, capabilities itself that are in, embodied with Lewis inside a bot framework are becoming much richer. Now, the most important thing, though, of the bot framework is the strategic importance for every business out there to build their own conversational canvas. Uh, just like you build websites, just like you build mobile applications, it becomes very important for every business out there to be in control of their own destiny when it comes to this new platform of conversations. The data, that is the conversation, is perhaps one of the most important pieces of data that all of you as developers as well as organizations have. So you want to ensure that the data is helping you, in fact, be in touch with your customers, your employees, and make them richer. And that's what you see. For example, BMW decided that they're going to own the personal assistant experience inside their car. Their brand needed to shine, and they're building using the bot framework their personal assistant. Similarly, uh, you have Jet. Uh, building their customer service agent using the bot framework because after all customer service is something that is so key for any business and the conversations that you have in through customer service is one of the most important knowledge repositories you want to have to improve your service and products over time and coca-cola is using it across a variety of functions internally with their employees from it to hr to finance so this is what we think is so critical. When you think about conversational assistance, it's really about you building that capability and then using the distribution of others' personal assistance. Uh, and so important uh, to recognize that. Now, we also have mixed reality services, which are, if you think about AI, HoloLens 2 is the quintessential AI I mean, AI device, which also happens to be the edge for Azure. Uh, in fact, if you look at the Unreal Engine and how it's implemented with streaming support, it's really amazing to see now how the combination of Azure plus this edge device can really push more polygons than ever before to create completely immersive experiences, right? So it's the cloud plus edge coming together with even amazing work that the Epic Games and the Unreal team have done in that case to be able to enable the next generation of mixed reality experiences. We also have now Azure services such as the Spatial Anchor service, uh, which allow you to build cross-device mixed reality experiences. So mixed reality to us is going to be something that's going to happen across Azure and Azure Edge, uh, across HoloLens 2 and Azure, but also all the other devices and Azure uh, to enable, for example, next generation of training, next generation of architecture design. And that's what you see. PACAR is using it to change training applications inside the organization, make it much more possible for people to ramp up quickly. Uh, Philips is using it for non-invasive surgery. Uh, PTC is using it for industrial design. So these are all applications that are getting built using mixed reality. And we are very excited to see what happens at this build and this next coming year in terms of really the exploitation of both Azure uh, as well as HoloLens 2. The new area for us is autonomous systems. Now, the autonomy is, comes in two forms. One is you watch things move or you enable things to move, and both of these are important. And so the set of services that we're launching are really the combination of simulation tools, because one of the keys for building autonomous system is your ability to have great simulation capability, uh, as well as we are bringing a new technique around machine teaching. So how do you take domain experts, take them, their expertise, and help teach these machines to be able to calibrate so that you can create autonomy? And those are the two sets of things that we are doing beyond what is available, obviously, with cognitive services. Uh, and, and you already see these uh, early examples. Toyota material handling is a great example where you have these pallets that are autonomous, and what they have done is to use AirSim and our simulation capability to create that autonomy. 
Uh, Shell is using our new machine teaching services as well as reinforcement learning in order to do precision drilling. So how do you take what is a very complex uh, task and really solidify, industrialize it uh, by creating this brain out of basically reinforcement learning and machine teaching? Same thing with Schneider Electric. In this case, it's about managing the temperature of rooms by sensing people in space or not. Uh, so this is a control system, but now you have an autonomous control system loop, which is really being driven by this machine teaching with reinforcement learning. So we are very excited about the types of apps uh, and the possibilities of what happens with the simulation capabilities as well as machine teaching. Now, that's a quick rundown of Azure, and as I said, uh, Scott's going to talk a lot more this afternoon about it. But I want to move to this next platform area, which is Dynamics 365 and Power Platform. Now, business applications, to me, is such an important category, because whenever I go to anywhere in the United States or anywhere in the world, the one thing that I have the real privilege of is to meet with developers, independent software developers, who are building business applications. This category is the lifeblood of digital skills and software jobs all over the world. Uh, it's just not. Uh, it really sort of sh shines the light that there is a lot of innovation happening beyond the West Coast of the United States and the East Coast of China when you think about the business applications category in particular. And that's why thinking about the productivity and leverage for this community is so important. Dynamics 365 has been completely rewritten to be an Azure cloud-native app. In fact, there will be a lot of sessions at this conference where we're going to talk about how it's been built uh, for microservices, completely ground up, how it's natively built for the Azure database, as well as Cosmos DB. Uh, the, everything about the architecture of Dynamics 365 itself is an amazing template for all of those who built SQL Server applications in the past and now are becoming multi-tenant SaaS applications. Uh, it's a unified solution. It's got AI built in. But most importantly is its extensibility framework through Power Platform. One of the hardest challenges for business applications has always been because there's no such thing as a canonical business process. It always changes by industry, and more importantly, it changes in time, because the businesses are not constant. So how do you deal with the customization? How do you deal with even IP from multiple ISVs in a particular instance? It's that N-way customization with upgradability. And those are some of the things that really Power Platform, along with Dynamics 365, solves. Now, what that means is there's tremendous amount of traction uh, for Dynamics today. There's 90% of the Fortune 500 are using Dynamics or Power Platform. But the most interesting thing is the number of ISVs uh, who are building on top of both Power Platform uh, and Dynamics all over the world. Uh, and now, the stack, I think, is the most important thing here, which is you not only have access as developers to the richness of Azure, everything in Azure infrastructure, data, AI, but now you can rely on the common data model, which is a bootstrap for all of the business process automation. To that, you can add your own entities, your own data. On top of that, you have the power platform that you can embed inside your own application. That means it's the workflow engine, it's the power apps, forms engine, uh, as well as Power BI, which is the analytics engine. So any SaaS application can use the same extensibility framework and then use Dynamics 365's modular architecture as you need. So that's why we see ISVs who build all the way to the top or all the way to the bottom of the stack. And in fact, most ISVs will use the combination of all these layers to be able to build their application. So this is what we see at scale. And in fact, just to give you a couple of examples, AdV is um, a media buying solution out of Australia. They have built on top of Dynamics and Power Platform. Uh, Anara is building a solution for automotive, uh, and this is for fleet management and equipment rental companies inside of the automotive industry. They built on top of Dynamics 365, and they're using, again, Power BI, COG services, uh, and integrating with Dynamics. Uh, we also have Indigene, which is uh, a life sciences uh, solution 
Uh, that's built on top of Dynamics 365. And Adobe is incorporating Power BI and the rest of Power Platform as part of their SaaS application. So it shows the combination of techniques being used by ISVs to incorporate business process automation as part of their applications. One of the other things that we're also doing is the Open Data Initiative in combination, in partnership with Adobe and SAP. Because one of the challenges organizations have as they adopt more SaaS apps is sometimes they create new silos. It's your data, it's your organizational data, whether it's about customers or suppliers or all, your own employee information. But when it goes to a SaaS application, or in fact, worse yet, if it goes into some marketing campaign in some, uh, or, you know, in, in some channel, they become very opaque to you. So the goal is to be able to make sure that all this data is in control by you. And that's what the Open Data Initiative is all about. Open Data Initiative starts with a data model that allows you to take data from these SaaS applications, enrich them using things like Azure Data Lake and all of the AI techniques, and then put the data back in side of these SaaS applications. But what that does is it allows you to break free of any one silo. An AI-first company is one where you can take data from one system and make the outcomes of the other system better. It's not about just optimizing that one system and its data. It's about being able to relate the insights, the reasoning from one to improve the outcomes in the other. And that's what the architecture of ODI enables. And in fact, you see this with what Unilever was able to do. Uh, it's a great example where they took some of the sustainability work they were doing, digitized it, used, in this case, SAP transactional information, as well as all the things that Azure provides from an Azure Data Lake side. But the most interesting thing is they said, okay, if we're gonna do all this around sustainability, what if we translated that into a campaign on the front end uh, using Adobe so that we can even help educate uh, and market to people on their audience who care about sustainability. So the combination of that is what was really amazing to see with Unilever where they broke free of any one silo and were able to bring all of the data to bear to improve what their business outcome is. Now, that's about Dynamics uh, 365 and Power Platform. As I said, it's great to think about this as an another first class part of our stack as you think about your application development because, because business process automation is so key and part of every application. Now, switching to Microsoft 365. Microsoft 365 is the world's productivity cloud across work and life. It's that core communications, collaboration, productivity scaffolding that spans work and life. It also acts as the scaffolding for business process workflow because it creates the opportunity for your business applications to drive so much more engagement by really using this UI that's in front of users all day long for their communication needs. It also is the security uh, endpoint and device as well as uh, applications. And so it's, it's a very comprehensive solution and it's got the, the main thing about Microsoft 365 is it's about starting by putting people at the center and then thinking about all of their activities across applications, across devices, right? That's the real change in how we think about uh, end user computing going forward, not starting from the device and then working forwards, but really thinking about the person and all the applications and all the devices in their life. That's the paradigm for Microsoft 365. And you see the, you know, what the, the way it manifests in terms of developer opportunity is with Microsoft Graph. So as things move to things like Office 365, what happens is a very rich database gets created a database that is about people, their relationships with other people, their artifacts, whether it's their schedules, documents, uh, projects, all of that is available as a first class database structure for you. And now, not only is there Microsoft Graph, but it's these rich canvases, whether it's Windows, Office, Edge, and Teams. So it's that combination platform opportunity that I want to talk about. Now, later this afternoon, Rajesh Jha will also be talking 
about all of the new capabilities across Windows, Office, Teams, Edge, and many of these capabilities. But I want to highlight a few things, starting in fact, uh, in fact, that's what's leading to all this customer momentum. The world's brands are using uh, my, my, Microsoft 365 today, and it's exciting to see even how some ISVs are using the Microsoft Graph. One of the announcements uh, at this conference is how Microsoft Graph is now available through Azure Data Connect for ISVs using the permissions granted by organizations so that you can add value. TalentSoft is an HR application provider out of France, and they are working with Christine Dior to fill out their teams and skill profiles by using the Microsoft Graph data that is Christian Dior's data. So that's a good canonical example of how graph data can enable even uh, business application vendors. Uh, and we think of this as a very rich ecosystem that's developing. Now, in fact, you see this even inside of Microsoft 365's own first party apps. Microsoft Search, which brings universal search capability, is built on same the graph structure. Uh, my analytics, uh, which really keeps track of our, my own focus and gives, guides me to make sure that my time is being spent on things that matter the most, uh, that's another example of a productivity tool, but it's a tool that's built using the graph data. Cortana is another example of that, uh, where we are really building out Cortana as a conversational interface for Microsoft 365 by really reasoning on top of the graph data. Talking about Cortana, we've now focused Cortana to really continuously keep improving on features like time to leave in Outlook is driven by Cortana, gives you heads up commitment every morning whenever I make commitments in email uh, and I forget about it, I, I'm reminded by Cortana about it each day so that I can keep track of the commitments I'm making. It even has suggested tasks, it's even doing suggested replies. So Cortana will continue to be that assistant that spans all of the endpoints of Microsoft 365. It's also been wired to bot framework as the extensibility framework. So that means if you want to write a skill, you want to be able to then wire that skill into Cortana using bot framework. And by the way, the same skill building using bot framework, you can wire it into Alexa and any other uh, assistant as well. So that's a way for you to think about your skills. Now, this is great. This is really progressing. But one of the things we are also hard at work at is to say, OK, if this is the first innings of what is conversational canvases, what's going to come next? Now, in spite of all the progress, you got to remember today most of the conversations that we have are still very brittle. They're truly not multi-turn. The context from turn to turn gets lost, especially when you, you know, human language is complex. Uh, it's complex where the context sometimes is subtle, so therefore how do you make sure that the natural language capabilities inside of these personal assistants is capable of having that shared context across a long dialogue versus just a, f a few turns? The second real challenge is today, most of these assistants are command systems where you have to invoke these skills one at a time. What if we can imagine a future where you can cross domains without having to invoke each skill by name? So what is a true multi-domain assistant? And of course, lastly, most importantly, we need a multi-agent world. The idea that you're always going to start with one wake word and one assistant is just not like how we start on the web, for example. Just imagine, what is, what is an open assistant future look like, similar to an open web? That's what we want to really ensure happens uh, when it comes to the personal assistant. So to showcase, I mean, in fact, last year we bought a company called Semantic Machines uh, that you know, we had, had fantastic natural language uh, researchers and experts. They, along with the rest of Microsoft research community and folks in the Microsoft 365 team, are hard at work in envisioning this future. And in fact, later on at the show floor, you'll be able to see some of the demos that manifest this. But I wanted to roll a video to showcase what is possible. That's Let's roll the video. What do I have today? Here's what your day looks like. Today you have, take a walk outside at 8 a.m., your one-on-one -on -one with Anjali at 10 a.m., lunch with Tom at noon, and your app kickoff at 3 p.m. 
Uh, go ahead and reschedule my walk to tomorrow at the same time. Sure. I can move take a walk outside to tomorrow at 8 a.m. Is that right? Yeah, that sounds great. Okay, I've moved it to tomorrow. And schedule a cram session with Nicholas and his manager from 9 to 1.30 today. And uh, we're going to need a room in Bellevue. Oh, okay. I'll invite Nicholas Cohn and Michelle Estes to the cram session, and I'll put your meeting in City Center 2605. Does that look good to you? Yeah. And push back my one-on-one -on -one with Anjali to tomorrow. All right, I've booked your meeting. And here are a couple of options to meet with Anjali Bot tomorrow. Is there anything later in the day? Let's see, how about this one? Yeah, that'll work. And is she invited to the app kickoff this afternoon? No, she's not on the invite. No, please send it to her. Okay, I've forwarded the app kickoff to Anjali Bot. Great. Oh, right. After my last meeting today, I schedule 30 minutes to pick up the birthday cake. Sure. Pick up the birthday cake at 4 p.m. Is that right? Yep. And remind me, where is my lunch meeting today? Lunch with Tom is at Liberty Cafe. What's the weather going to be like? It'll be mostly sunny and 71 degrees at Liberty Cafe at noon today. Can we eat outside there? Yes. Liberty Cafe has outdoor seating. And can you send directions to my car? Connecting to car skill. Sure, directions to Liberty Cafe have been sent to your car. When's our next review with Cyrus? Your next quarterly review with Cyrus Nafani is Tuesday, June 11th at 10 a.m. Schedule a two-hour dry run with Benjamin McIntosh the Friday before that. All right. Does this work for you? Yep, that looks great. I've scheduled your dry run with Benjamin. Thank you. Happy to help. We are very excited to continue to push towards this future with Cortana and Bot Framework, true multi-turn, multi-domain, multi-agent world. Now switching to talk about the canvases, starting with Windows and Office. Now one of the great opportunities that is in front of us with over 800 million Windows 10 devices as well as a, a billion Office 365 and Microsoft 365 endpoints across devices is the opportunity for developers who have written applications for these platforms to extend their reach. Every app, whether it's a Win32 app, whether it's a WPF app, a UWP app, any app can be annotated with graph data. And all of these applications can also now incorporate natural user interface, whether it's speech, Windows, hello, ink, and that's what we see with developers. Uh, so for example, uh, with Windows developers, Fluid Math has built a fantastic educational app with great inking support to teach math. Uh, Concepts, which is a drawing application, in fact uses both uh, inking as well as the surface dial to bring their applications to life. And when it comes to office extensibility, for example, SurveyMonkey, you know, in situ in an Outlook email, even on a phone, uh, can do the survey because of these action cards that are built into Outlook. Uh, Bloomberg's taken all of their rich service and data and incorporated it into Excel using the Excel add-ins and custom functions uh, capability. So that just shows you how Office scaffold, endpoint scaffolding or application development in Windows gets richer uh, across all of the frameworks that you may have used because of the graph as well as natural user interface. So that's how we think about the future of Windows and Office development. Now, I want to talk about Edge and what we're doing with web. You know, one of the things it, it for us is really a set of commitments we are making to the web and web development. It starts with open source. In fact, 
Edge is built on Chromium. Uh, we are fully participating in the OSS community there. Uh, we have already made contributions around ARM64 support. Uh, we're also bringing accessibility support uh, to the code base so that all browsers built on the Chromium project can benefit from it. Uh, we'll, we've brought touch capabilities. So we're going to contribute back to the open source community so that all browsers built on that code base can get, improve and get better. It also starts with a commitment to be truly cross-platform. We're going to have Edge on Windows 10. We're going to have Edge on Windows 7, Edge on iOS and Android, and so we're going to and, and the Mac. And we're going to have support for all platforms. That means end users are going to be able to use one browser across their work and life. This is great for both developers as well as IT professionals. So that's our support and commitment uh, for cross-platform. But we're also committed to innovating on the web. One of the things that we're very excited about is to, oh, so before I go to innovation, let me talk about privacy and security, because we're really committed to ensuring that the transparency and choice is there for anyone browsing, because the most important thing is to show, make sure that all the data that's being tracked and collected on the web is something that is first very much transparent to the end user, and the end user is in control about their own privacy and security. And so we want to make sure that we are pushing uh, the envelope on that. And on top of that, we also want to make sure we are innovating on the web. Uh, when it comes to innovation, the first area we are focused on is collaboration. We believe we can, in fact, bring the next generation of real-time collab to the web. But these distributed data structures that are client-side with a cloud relay, we believe we can bring collaboration that truly enhances productivity of the web, and it'll work across all browsers. And that's something that I want to really, really see us you know, push forward with, with great developer support, both inside of M365 and the developer community. And to show you all of this uh, set of demos, let me throw it out to our team on the floor. Thank you, Satya. Hi, everyone. I'm Divya Kumar from the Microsoft Edge team. I know most of you are already trying out the early previews and have started giving us feedback, so thank you. Today, I'm going to show experiences we're working on in three areas. How Edge will offer a seamless web experience for enterprises, how we're thinking about approaching privacy, and how we can help improve productivity on the web. Let's start with enterprise. Organizations are looking for ways to better connect their employees with resources. The new tab page on Microsoft Edge that's customizable by IT shows me my most recently used documents and other corporate resources, so they're just a click away. And with Microsoft Search, which is an enterprise search offering using Bing technology and Microsoft Graph, Edge can show me contextually relevant search results from my organization. Let's say I'm looking for my vacation tracking tool. You can see that it's the first result and even includes a snapshot. But what we're excited to announce today is that Edge will offer built-in support for Internet Explorer. Over 60% of enterprises worldwide use IE because they have internal sites that require legacy compatibility. Today, if I were to open this site in an older version of the browser, a separate IE window would open. I'll be forced to switch back and forth between two browsers where one has my favorites in history and the other doesn't. It's disruptive. So we fixed it. Now when I click this link, the site opens in the same window and in the same tab with IE mode. So no more jarring experiences when you hit an internal site that needs Internet Explorer. The combination of compatibility, customizability, and legacy support makes this a fantastic choice for enterprises. Now let's talk about privacy. We get a range of reactions from customers when talking about how their browsing data is used across the web. Let's take targeted ads, for example. Some find it valuable, 
some find it creepy, and some just don't care. We're exploring simple tools that lets you control who can see what you browse. Here's a feature we're working on. In the privacy and security settings, I have three options. Depending on which option I pick, Edge adjusts how third parties can track me across the web. Unrestricted is a great option if you're fine with how things work today. Strict is a good option for those who would prefer to block all third-party trackers, even if that means some limitations. The balance setting blocks trackers from sites you haven't visited or don't give you the right level of transparency or control of your data. Regardless of which you choose, Edge will block malicious trackers. While browsing on the site, I can click on the lock icon, and it tells me exactly what setting I'm on. And you can see that I'm on balance. And I can see the number of trackers that are allowed and number of trackers that are blocked. Privacy is a sensitive issue. And we think it's meaningful to empower you through transparency and a few added controls. Now let's move on to productivity. When I research on the web, it can be a really manual process. I can have dozens of tabs open. I've got multiple windows all arranged carefully so I can compare things. I can take screenshots for sharing. I'm copying and pasting content into documents. It can be pretty tedious. We're working on a feature called Collections. It helps me gather, organize, and share content more efficiently. I can launch Collections by clicking on the icon on the top right. You can see that I've already created a few collections. But what I personally love about collections, besides the ability to collect different types of content as I'm browsing the web, is that I can email my collections directly from Edge. I can copy and paste an entire collection into other apps. Yeah. I can even export it to Word and Excel. And Edge does all the formatting for me. I'll start a new collection so you can see how it works. I'm actually looking for a camera for my niece and trying to collect some photography tips. So here I am uh, on a page. As I look, I can start to drag and drop content. And I can also switch tabs. And I can drag and drop text as well. And once I'm done looking at uh, the content that I have, I can uh, choose from one of the options that I've got. So you can see I can email, copy the clipboard. But I'm going to go with Export to Word and show you how it works. Edge creates a clean document, even automatically includes citations. How cool is that? Now let me open another collection I'd started earlier so you can see how Export to Excel works. These are some of the cameras I'd been saving up to compare earlier. Going back into Share, I'm going to click on Export to Excel. Collections does all the copy and pasting for me and categorizes it for me into a table that lets me do quick side-by-side -side comparison. It does this using the metadata that accompanies the site or content I collected. This shows how serious we are about innovating on the web beyond just delivering on compatibility. We think these experiences are valuable to how we use the web today. And we look forward to evolving them with your feedback on the PC and on the phone. And now, Mike Morton from the Office Engineering team is going to introduce you to something we're calling Fluid Framework that works cross-browser. Over to you, Mike. Thanks, Divya. Today, it is my honor to represent the Microsoft 365 team and introduce the Fluid Framework. The Fluid Framework is a new set of technologies that developers can use to build experiences for any browser that break down barriers between people and barriers between apps. It allows people to work in fundamentally new ways. We are excited to share with you a sneak preview of how Fluid may change the way you work with Microsoft 365 apps like Word, Teams, and Outlook. This will include hyper-fast co-authoring, AI and bots that collaborate with you, and components that make it easy to reuse content across tools. I'll start with a very simple scenario, co-authoring a document. Let me type just a little bit of text. Great. When Fluid powers co-authoring, collaboration feels immersive, natural, and smooth. My colleague Chica here is typing on a machine backstage, but her session is going through a data center in the central United States. Chica is working in one of these four browsers. You'll notice Edge and Chrome both on the screen. 
but it is so fast, you might not actually be able to tell which one. She's actually using the Edge browser in the upper left. I'm going to go ahead and bring a pen here. Inking is even more latency sensitive. I'm going to do some quick drawing. Each of my key uh, drawings is, takes up quite a bit more data than regular plain text. We put Chica's screen side by side with mine. You'll see the latency is so low, it's hard to see the difference as we draw. Fluid's architecture allows Chica and I to collaborate as if we were on the same device, even in higher bandwidth scenarios. But collaboration is not just about people working together, but a combination of people working together with AI. I'm going to do a little bit more text typing here. Translated to eight languages. Sorry. Great. As I was typing that text, hopefully you noticed that it was being translated into nine different languages, one of the each screens that you have over above. This is just one example of bots participating as collaborators in Fluid. Fluid will enable scenarios where we have tens or even hundreds of agents helping users in areas such as proofing, data insights, design ideas, security scanning, and much, much more. I'd now like to show you Fluid components. Here I have a document, and I want to go ahead and copy a table and get some input from the team members. I can go ahead and paste it into a conversation here. Um, because it's a Fluid component, we can, we can continue to collaborate on it, even across apps. I can even go ahead and filter it down to just what's relevant for the conversation. Just unhide the column. Um, you'll see that uh, Cheek is actually backstage editing data. Of course, I can edit data right here in the main document. And what's happening, one of us is working in Teams, Chica backstage. I'm working in Word. And together, we're collaborating on the same data on the same underlying table. All right, let's go back to the document here. And I'll go ahead and insert a chart. When I insert a chart, you'll actually see a set of recommended charts. This is an example of a collaborative bot analyzing the data and providing intelligence on what visualization would work out best. I'll go ahead and choose this chart here. And I can even add a formula in line in my document I'll go ahead and summarize or do a sum um, of the number of units being delivered. And I'll click Enter and kind of scroll up. And again, I can continue to change numbers. Chica can change numbers backstage. And you'll see the, uh, the chart, the formula, and the underlying table all being updated in real time. Um, you may have noticed that I got a little email notification from, uh, from Chica while we're um, uh, working. Uh, the Fluid framework isn't just about new apps like Teams, but can be integrated into almost any application experience. I'll go ahead and click on this message here. And you'll see this is not just an ordinary table. This is a Fluid component. It's collaborative, and it's updating in real time. This scenario with Word, Teams, and Outlook shows Fluid aiding productivity by providing low latency collaboration, AI co-authors, and embeddable components. Thank you so much for letting us share an early preview of the Fluid framework. Later this year, this technology will come to Microsoft 365 Experiences and be exposed to developers through an SDK. Back to you, Sacha. Thank you, Divya and Mike. I think the world is ready for another choice when it comes to web and innovation. We are very, very excited about both Edge as well as the Fluid Framework and what developers can do with it. Now I want to move to Teams. Uh, teams, by far, in my own experience at, at Microsoft, is the fastest growing application uh, that I've seen. Uh, it's tremendous to see its growth, but one of the most interesting things is the opportunity it creates for developers. When you think about Teams, it's a scaffolding that has four capabilities built into it. It has messaging, it has video conferencing and meetings, it has collaboration, as well as the ability to integrate any business process workflow. All these four things are possible using the team scaffolding. And we are seeing tremendous adoption across customers. And one of the things that really Teams for the first time has shown is that Microsoft 365 toolchain is not just for the knowledge workers. In fact, some of the fastest growing use cases in Microsoft 365 is what we describe as first line usage. So this is retail specialists, people on the factory floor, on, in the hospitals using Teams. Uh, some examples, Hendrix Sports is using it for their NASCAR training uh, team. Uh, uh, Marks and Spencers is using it for the retail specialists in the stores. Uh, NHS is using it to bring care coordination uh, in their hospitals. 
So these are amazing examples of how teams and the four capabilities all light up uh, to enable this. And to show you all of the new capabilities and features in Teams, as well as the rich hardware ecosystem opportunity and how that is developing around Teams and some of the new innovation, I wanted to invite up on stage Rana Amjadi from our Teams organization. Come on up. Thanks, Satya. Thank you. Microsoft Teams was designed to foster an inclusive work culture for every worker from the C-suite to the first line. This first line area of the workforce, like retail associates or factory technicians, has traditionally been underserved by technology. But we're working hard to change that. Earlier this year, we introduced the team's mobile first line experience. You can see here, first line workers, they're often usually the first to respond when something goes awry. Now they can take a picture of, of the situation using the smart camera, annotate it, add some context, and in this situation, it's a cleanup, but it could be a factory chemical spill. They can mark these messages as urgent or important, make sure the right people see them right time. They can also share the location, making it easier to keep track of deliveries or meet up with a team. And with the new shift experience in Teams, they can easily see their shift schedule, sign up for, or swap shifts with coworkers, all right from the phone. Now, you may remember last year at Build, we showed you our vision for modern meetings. Let's take a look at how we're bringing that to life in Teams. We focus on making the meetings experience more inclusive and hassle-free with live captions that make it easier for everyone to engage in the conversation. With customized backgrounds that help you minimize the distractions behind you. Pretend you're on the beach or pretend you're in the office if you're actually on the beach. Teams will also help you find meeting rooms based on your proximity, making it easier for you and your team to just hop into a quick huddle and you'll have the full immersive meeting experience with multiple video streams like Brady Bunch style. But what would a keynote be without a little bit of magic? People joining the meeting remotely should feel as included in the discussion even if the team is brainstorming on a whiteboard. So by simply connecting a USB webcam to the team's room, using AI, the room will find the whiteboard image and straighten it to make it more legible. It also detects people and makes them transparent. So if someone walks in front of the whiteboard to write something, the team online will be able to see right through them, like literally right through them. <laughs> it's pretty cool. And all of these features have been designed to work best with our ecosystem of Teams devices, making meetings and callings experiences better in conference rooms, at your desk, and on the go. It's been so incredible to see what you've been building with our apps across so many categories and industries. Whether you're using Office 365 apps, any of our hundreds of partner apps, or building your own, Teams unifies all of these experiences into one hub. And it's up to you to choose how to bring that to life for your organization. Whether that's through developing your own solutions and using Power Apps to integrate workflows, or surfacing actionable canvases to meet your users where you are. Now, Rajesh will go much deeper into how to build custom apps for Teams in the Microsoft 365 keynote. But all of these points draw on the Microsoft graph, opening up a wide range of possibilities for empowering your people and your organization. This is the power of the Teams platform, and we're so excited to see what you build next. Now, let's check out how one of our partners, Spatial, has teamed up with Mattel to build custom solutions using HoloLens and Microsoft 365 to make collaboration a more immersive experience. Let's head to the showcase floor. Thanks. Thank you, Rana. I'm excited to show you, our fellow developers, how we at Spatial have been able to enrich our existing holographic collaboration app with HoloLens 2, Azure Spatial Anchors, the Microsoft Graph, and Teams. We were really blown away by how quick and easy it was to use these simple APIs to make Spatial even more useful for our customers by leveraging the power of the Microsoft Graph that they are already running their businesses on. For example, we're going to show you how our customer Mattel ideates, designs, and collaborates across global borders on multiple brands that we all know and love, like Hot Wheels, Barbie, and Fisher-Price. Let's take a look. So I'm going to jump onto my PC here, and I'm already in a Teams channel. 
and I can see Amanda's posted some cool new content, but why don't we upgrade this to a live spatial meeting to get everyone on the same page? I'm actually just gonna click over to the spatial tab in Teams, and I get this really cool 3D dollhouse view. I'm gonna click into the room where I can see everybody, but since I have a HoloLens 2 here, why don't I take this off a 2D screen into a 3D meeting? All I have to do is scan the QR code in the corner. I'm gonna put on the device and scan the code. Here we go. Oops. Hey, Amanda, what's up? It looks like you're already in here. Yep, I'm here in my office, also wearing a HoloLens 2. So you'll see me in the room show up as an avatar. And all of our content that you just saw from that Teams channel is already up here on the wall. You can even see some of the comments thanks to the Microsoft Graph API. Cool. And with the new finger hand tracking in HoloLens 2, it's so easy to quickly triage content. So I can quickly just grab a document off the wall and toss it right up there on our shared workspace so we can all take a look. And if I want Amanda to check out something, I can just pull it off the wall and toss it to her. What do you think of that one, Amanda? Wow, that looks great. And just to recap what happened here, I grabbed a holographic image on the wall as a real person in this room and threw it to an avatar who could be anywhere in the world. Wow, this is awesome. Now, with the new hand tracking capabilities in the Mixed Reality Toolkit, I can also have this cool new hand dock. So I'll just pull it up, and it lets me pull up content from a variety of locations, like my OneDrive. I'm just gonna scroll the 3D models that are stored on it, and select Sky Justice. There we go. And let's make this life-size, and zoom this up a little bigger. And you know, Amanda, I'm thinking, why don't we show off the new freehand annotation capabilities and give her some accessories? Absolutely. I think she really could use a bracelet and, of course, the finishing touch, a HoloLens. Everyone needs a HoloLens. Awesome. Oh, hey, Lynn. It looks like Lynn just joined. Hey, everyone. I love this. Joining from my PC, I'm still able to participate in the experience, even without a HoloLens. So are you ready to see what I've been working on? Yeah, let's check it out. Since I've joined from my laptop via the spatial tab in Teams you saw earlier, I can easily browse and upload content directly from my PC and upload it to the meeting. Check out this 3D model of a hover pack. Sweet. This is cool. You know, Amanda, since this is mixed reality, why don't you uh, jump in and give it a spin? Of course. Let's try it out. Wow, it's even cooler on the inside. Now, <laughs> now Sp Spatial's a hardware agnostic platform. You don't need just a headset to join the experience. Uh, to, let me invite Jacob onto the stage. Now he's gonna show you how you can join from the device in your pocket. Oh, this is so dope. I love it. Great work, Lynn. With Azure Spatial Anchors, this mixed reality experience shares a map across HoloLens and AR Kit and AR Core. This means that I could have the most immersive experience on a HoloLens, or I can use this Android phone here to not only see what everyone else is seeing, but actively participate and modify the content as well. Nice. Thanks, guys. Solid meeting, and uh, really looking forward to showing this to the rest of the team tomorrow. Now, if you haven't done so already, I would really encourage you to integrate your app with the Microsoft Graph. All we had to do to make this whole experience a reality for our customers like Mattel was connect with one simple unified API that leverages all the power of Microsoft 365. And developers, if you've been waiting to jump aboard the mixed reality train, now is the time because the HoloLens 2 is sweet. You can now reach out and touch holograms for the first time and it is so cool. Add on the power of Azure Spatial Anchors and you get the ability to extend your experience to any device. So AR developers can embrace AR regardless of the device they choose, whether it's HoloLens, mobile, or anything in between. All right, well, thank you for having us, and come experience this all firsthand at the Spatial Booth in Hall 4E, and back to you, Satya. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Rana, Amanda, Anand, Jacob, and Lynn. It's fantastic to see the entirety of the stack come to life. Just to sort of quickly recap, you have Azure and all of the run rich runtime services, uh, including the new mixed reality services in Azure. Uh, you have the common data model and the Microsoft Graph to help bootstrap with data. 
Of course, you can bring all of your own data. Power Platform on top of it can be the extensibility framework. In fact, Power Platform is the extensibility framework for both Microsoft 365 and Dynamics 365, as well as your SaaS applications. And then on top of it, you have Microsoft 365 as well as Dynamics 365. So the ability for a developer to take the full stack, whatever layer that makes sense for you, that's the type of application development that we envision uh, going forward. Now, this last platform uh, has got, you know, real special place inside of Microsoft. It's gaming. It, you know, we can trace uh, gaming all the way back to the very origins of Microsoft. In fact, this is a program that Bill wrote, uh, very famous, uh, one night uh, when he, I think this is just before the first IBM PC DOS operating system came out and he had worked obviously on the uh, basic runtime and somebody said, hey, you need to build a sample app and so he decided to build donkey.bass that night. And, um, you know, it's up on GitHub. I don't know what the pull request status is. I'm sure it'll improve after today. Uh, but it is, uh, so for us, gaming has always uh, been uh, very important, uh, and we are very committed to creating a tremendous opportunity going forward with gaming. And it starts with the same metaphor that we used for a Microsoft 365. That is by putting the gamer at the center and ensuring that they can play their games, of course, on the console, on the PC, as well as on mobile. Right? That's what all of our innovation uh, is centered on, whether it is what we're doing with the Xbox, what we're doing with PC gaming, uh, what we're doing with Game Pass Mixer. It's to enable that future for gaming. Now, what that means is even for the game developer, we want to put the game developer at the center and bring the entirety of the Microsoft game stack so that developers can build amazing games. In fact, right on Azure, we have tremendous uh, traction for game development. Uh, you have people like Rare, Ubisoft, Wizards of the Coast, all building these amazing game experiences using the power of the cloud. But there are two examples I just wanted to call out as part of game stack. The first one is Xbox Live. Now, Xbox Live has got 63 million uh, users. It's the most vibrant gaming social network out there. And now it's available uh, on uh, iOS and Android. That means game developers on iOS and Android can incorporate the network into their gameplay and help really drive engagement. And it's really exciting to see Gameloft, uh, the creators of very big hit games from Asphalt to uh, Order and Chaos and Modern Combat, all incorporating uh, now Xbox Live as part of their gaming. So we think of uh, you know, basically Xbox Live being brought to uh, mobile platform as being super helpful for game developers. Another service that I want to highlight is Azure PlayFab. Now, Azure PlayFab really captures, I think, the essence of what game development is all about, because game development doesn't stop with the game being launched. In some sense, you could even say it starts after the game is launched, because you want to be able to experiment, learn through analytics, and continuously change gameplay. And that's what is described as live ops. Just like how we have DevOps, with game development, you have something called live ops, which I think increasingly is going to be true in many of the other application development categories as well, but for sure in gaming. And that's what Azure Play Fab enables, which is it's a rich pass service. It's already got a billion accounts in it from, because of the gamers, uh, because all the developers using it are really using uh, these accounts to help drive gameplay in a personalized basis. And it's really exciting to see Roblox partner up with Azure PlayFab to bring this to their community of developers. So we are very, very excited uh, to see how this really enables all of the community of developers building on Roblox to be able to use game PlayFab and really enhance the experience. So gaming, again, uh, is very rich uh, opportunity. And I just wanted to roll a video of GameStack for you. The hardware consists of a master control and two player control units.
It's really exciting to see the developer opportunity in front of us. What you saw today is how we're building the best modern technology stack for applications, data and AI, business process automation, communications and productivity, as well as gaming. These platforms are rich canvases for you in this era of the cloud and the edge to enable you to turn the dreams that you all have into reality. Not just imagine the future, but to create it, to build these magical experiences. Magical experiences that empower people to be more productive and collaborative. Magical experiences that help organizations to grow, evolve, thrive. Magical experiences that address the most pressing challenges out there, whether in education, healthcare, Magical experiences that help people connect, relax, have fun. It's this community here that has the power to create that future. And most importantly, to build a world that we all want to live in. I can't wait to see the magic you build, but first I want to leave you with a sneak peek to some magic our team is creating right outside this convention center. Thank you all very, very much. I have a fantastic build.